My name is Yael. Welcome to the fourth in the series of CATS Innovation webinars. Uh, I work with Mike Garam and Dan Smokler on this initiative. And to remind everyone, this is the next step of what we started at HIGA at the CATS Innovation Summit. And it is a space for you guys to innovate, dream, scheme, and achieve new things together. So we're really excited to see returning summiteers and returning webinar junkies. Uh, and we hope that you will join us for our last um, webinar as well, um, which will be next week on May 30th on Wednesday. Um, if you'd like more information on that webinar and have not received it yet, feel free to email me at ykeller at penhillel.org. Um, I would now love to turn it over to Beth Cousins, who is now the Associate Vice President of Jewish Education and Engagement at the Jewish Federations of North America. Beth was the Associate Vice President at Hillel at the SIC, where she launched the Department of Organizational Learning and invigorated the Meyerhoff Center for Jewish Experience. Um, I have the great privilege to say that Beth was my supervisor at the SIC, and I know she'll be a phenomenal teacher today. So I turn the floor over to you, Beth. Thanks, Yael. Thanks, everybody. Hi. It's nice to see um, and meet so many people. I, um, you know, I as, as Yael said, I was part of the law for a little while, and it's um, a virtual space and virtual community that is near to, and dear to me. You'll forgive me. Hi, Susanna. Um, so I learned a lot of this from Susanna, I confess, and, um, and it's a pleasure to see you here. And um, I will probably refer back to your work and ask you to contribute. But I'm also going to ask everybody to contribute. So, um, you know, this is going to be a collective conversation. Um, so I, I wanted to start um, with that contribution. I want to ask us to go around the virtual room. Um, introduce ourselves, answer a question, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep throwing some questions out. Um, and I, I'm hoping, we won't do this for too long, um, I'm hoping though it's going to be helpful in, um, in steering me toward like the kind of content that you actually want to talk about and grapple with, um, and also um, uh, give us some cases, actually, literally, um, that we'll work on later. Before we do that, I want to encourage everybody to turn on your cameras because um, it's really helpful, you know, to actually like see each other and not just see the background. And maybe I'm going to go mute. But some not people. your microphones. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, whoever just muted a bunch of people. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Uh, I'm going to call on people. We've all done the Zoom thing. I'm going to call on people because otherwise we don't know what order we're in. So Meg, jump in. Um, introduce yourself. And um, and if you can, answer the question, why did you sign up for this webinar? Rochester, um, and the reason why I signed up for this webinar is because I've been involved with the, the CATS Innovation Summit since um, HIGA, and every time I leave one of these webinars, I leave super invigorated and excited to, to do next steps. Oh, great. All right, good. I'll take it. Okay, great. And you're at the University of Rochester. Tell Dennis I said hi. Um, and what kind of work are you doing? Um, I'm a Springboard Innovation Fellow, so I'm oh, great. Personal, professional. Yep, 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 yep. I know the lingo, I think. Um, cool. Okay, Susan, jump on in. Introduce yourself. Why did you sign up? Hi. Um, I am Susan. I am the Jewish Life Director at Hillel at Temple University. That is in Philadelphia. Hi, Marley. Um, um, I signed up for this. I also was, um, I went to a couple of sessions at HIGA um, Summit, uh, Innovation Summit sessions, and um, I thought this one looked particularly interesting. Um, I always try to, I try to think from a perspective of like starting with um, impact and results, so I thought this would be really helpful because I, this is where, how I try to think, and I hope this will help me do that more. Me too. Um, Susanna, jump on in. Um, I am Susanna in transition. <laughs> so I am, I have an end date at the Ohio State University Hillel Foundation. It is Wednesday, June 5th, kind of hysterical. Starting the new campus support director. No, I don't know my territory. Don't ask me uh, on July 2nd. And I'm on, um, you know, because I am a Beth Cousins groupie, and I was beyond excited to see that you were doing a Hillel U class, which I'm also a groupie of, and just, 
I will go anywhere and think about anything if you are, you know, helping. I'll take it. I'll take it. Thanks, Susanna. It really is nice to see you. Um, uh, I'm going to get it wrong. Alyssa or Alisa? Yeah, it's Alyssa. Hi. Um, Alyssa. I'm the Associate Director of Ryerson University here in Toronto. Um, and I also have gone to a couple of these webinars and I'm, I, I find them really helpful and really interesting and make you think about things differently. So I'm just excited to learn something new. Great. All right. I'll take it. Ma, now I'm like totally uh, multitasking with the names, guys. Don't forgive me. I'm doing a lot of looking down. Mara, jump on in. Um, so I am the Engagement Director at the Hillel University of Georgia. And I, we're right now working on putting together our fall schedule together. Um, and so I thought that this might be helpful to thinking about how we do that in a different way. Yes, yes, excellent, awesome. Thanks, Mara. Marley. Hi, um, I'm Marley Wiener. I am the rabbi and senior Jewish educator at Hill at Binghamton um, in the beautiful Binghamton, New York. And this will be my, <laughs> I, do we have an alumni? Maybe something, somebody cheered. Um, and I am going to be entering into my second year on the job. And the first year kind of felt like I got dumped in the middle of a hurricane. Um, and I'm trying to figure out ways to be more strategic the second time around. Great, 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 great. We're gonna run out of time. These are such good case studies. Great, uh, Maggie, jump on in. Um, I'm Maggie Shapiro Haskin. I am the Director of Jewish Life at Washington and Lee University in uh, Lexington, Virginia. Um, I'm with Marley on the uh, first year hurricane. I started this position with zero clue um, and was given very little to go on. So my entire year has been figuring out what the heck to do. Um, and I'm really looking forward to being much more strategic in my thinking from next year. I've restructured my student board. Super excited, but there's a lot of planning to do. <laughs> totally, totally. Sounds like Kayla. Uh, Kayla, jump on in. Hi. hi. Oh, turn your sound off, dude. Um, hi, I'm Kayla. Sorry, I'm sitting next to Meg, literally right next to each other. Um, <laughs> I am currently the director of engagement, soon to be the assistant director um, here at the University of Rochester. And I'm on this phone call because um, I'm trying to get a better sense of how we do things all around and how to take what we're doing in terms of engagement and put it into different words. That way I can translate it to our community partners and our donors. Interesting. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Kayla. Becca. Hi, I'm Becca. I work at, um, I'm the program associate at Northwestern. Um, and one of the reasons why I want to take this course is similar to what I think Marley was saying, was looking to just strategize better now that it's going into my second year um, and really realizing like what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, and then how we can reorganize things in order to best support those two things. Um, so kind of just working in that sense over the summer while we have time once the students are gone. Totally, great, great, love it. Uh, Esther, hi Esther. Mute. How about now? Let's you there you go. Okay, great. Yep. So, hi, I'm Rabbi Esther Reed. I work at the Hillel at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And I'm taking this course because I love Beth Cousins, like Susanna Sagan. I'm a Beth Cousins groupie, so I'll just follow her wherever she goes. <laughs> I feel like we should, like, do something fun with that, right? Like, go to Hawaii or something. Um, uh, I mean, Alex, do you want to jump in? <laughs> You'll take that too, right? All right. Yeah. Alex, do you want to jump in? Sure. Hi. I'm Alex Zisman. I'm the coordinator of Jewish Student Life at Carnegie Mellon University at the Hillel JUC of Pittsburgh. Susanna. Um, and um, oh, hi, Susanna. and uh, uh, I'm also on this call, like many other people said, because we are strategizing and planning, and I'm definitely looking to see how we can be strategic about our impact and think, think forward as the new year begins soon. Great, 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 great. Awesome. Anna. Ta-da! Happy birthday, Alex. Thanks. Anna, yay! Mute. Unmute, unmute. Oh, there we go. 
ta-da. Wait a second. Yeah. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Hi. You're good. Good? Okay. Um, I'm Anna from uh, Russia. I'm a senior judicial educator here in Russia and happy to be here with you. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Love it. Mahal. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm Michal Greenbaum. I'm the UConn Hillel. And uh, similar to everybody else, I'm curious to learn more about the measuring impact um, as a way to help convey it to our community partners and donors. Measuring impact. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Leah, you were going to be last. She's with a student. Um, Michelle, I, I don't think I got you, right? Did you just jump on? Do you want to jump in? Hi, yes, uh, sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. Hi. And there you are. Yep, here I am. I'm Michelle Bernstein Horowitz. I'm at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and I am just really curious to hear kind of how people, what other people are doing, get some inspiration as we're doing planning for next year. Great, 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 great. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, Leah, Leah, uh, what, uh, you good or no? Yes, sorry about that. Can you hear oh, me? Perfect. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, so hi, I'm Leah Steph and I work at WashU Hillel in St. Louis. Um, and I'm the Program and Engagement Associate and Ezra Fellow. So a lot of what I do is very student group focused and Jewish learning focused. And I haven't done much with cats at all and I hear great things and I just want to uh, learn more. Great. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. Okay, great. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to jump right in. We, I was going to ask I was going to ask you to explore a couple of other questions. When have you used goals effectively? And what's something that you're working on, like very, something very concrete versus like, you know, what I just asked about the big picture, um, that you want to incorporate all of this into? We're going to skip those um, and go right into a conversation about starting with the end in mind. Oh, I forgot to share my screen. Um, and I think we'll do a lot more conversation as we go. Um, and I did have a text study that I'm also going to skip for now because I want to I want to hit some things first, um, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to the text study. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, whose little faces are hiding some of the text? That's the challenge. Okay. Okay. So um, when we were thinking about um, the approach that we wanted to take to this webinar. I realized the following things. Goals and data are actually an incredibly big conversation. We use data constantly. We um, take in data all the time to assess what we're going to do next. And that means when we're sitting with a student, right, we're taking in data and trying to figure out what we're going to do next. At the end of the day, um, when we have to do something, you know, again next week, we say, well, how did this go, right? How am I going to tweak it for next week? Um, in the middle of a program, we're taking in data and saying, um, you know, how are we going to go on with the next hour and a half of this program, right? Um, and that's just on a day-to-day -day basis. There's also, obviously, when we report to the board four times a year on how we're doing, and then there's also when we report to, you know, National Hillel and to our funders and to ourselves about how we're doing um, on an annual basis, let's say. There's impact-related data, as some of you referred to, um, and there's also what I call progress-related data. Um, and then there's also tons of other buckets of kinds of goals, which we're going to touch on a little bit in the next hour. Um, there's professional development goals, there's learning goals, there's um, goals for relationships, there's goals related to like the inner workings of your Hillel, right? How strong your culture is, um, your business operations. In other words, there's like tons of ways to go when it comes to collecting data, using data, and setting goals. I should stop there and add a side note, which is, um, so I've done a lot of evaluation in my life for a little while. I, I did um, work on evaluation professionally as a consultant for different organizations. Um, and I often say, and I often reminded myself that the only reason I really care about evaluation is that evaluation is a way of making sure you set excellent goals, right? So I, this whole conversation should be in the context of the following. Um, the relationship between goals and data is that, and actually this is exactly what we're about to talk about, I'm like sort of, um, you know, stealing my own punchline, um, is that uh, if you have really good goals, you can collect the data. If you don't have really good goals, it, you, you can collect data, but it, the data doesn't matter because it doesn't tell you anything about how you're doing. 
So, um, so when I was just talking about goals and data for a second, I was dancing between the two, and that's why I was dancing between the two. The reason that um, it matters that there's a ton of different kinds of data and there's a ton of different kinds of goals, those two things are, are like two sides of the same coin. Um, and the reason all of this matters is because we had to figure out, well, how to focus in, um, you know, 45 minutes um, in, a, in a way that's actually going to be impactful and memorable and usable for everybody in the conversation. So what we landed on was starting with the end in mind. Um, which is exactly the point that I just made, right? And I'm probably going to make it six more times before, um, and we're all going to make it before the conversation's over. Um, because again, if you if you have a good sense of where you're going, um, then you can collect data and um, and you can actually like get somewhere concrete. Um, and so we're going to touch on a little bit on impact and a little bit on maybe a few other things, probably less, probably mostly on on like. Um, general programmatic goals um, and a little bit on goals related to impact and not on the other goals um, because we felt like that was just a, a good strategic thing to focus on for this whole CAT series. Um, okay, so Lewis Carroll writes um, a conversation between Alice in Wonderland and the Cheshire Cat. Would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. Well, I don't much care where, said Alice, but it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added as an explanation. Well, you're sure to do that, said the cat, if you only walk long enough. Um, so again, I kind of just said that, but I want to pause on it because it's so important and then ask people for an example um, of when they kind of meandered, as the cat points out, right? Um, so anybody want to comment on this? Anything that it calls to mind for people? Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? Is there a moment um, in your in your work when you did something sort of like the Cheshire Cat? Something um, that comes to my mind is um, I remember when I first started uh, in my job at Hillel, which was now two years ago, um, and I remember like having a conversation with my boss and him kind of explaining to me that he wanted me to be like really autonomous in my work, um, which I appreciated. And he kind of like put it in the way of like, here are like the goals, like here's your endpoint and like how you get there, you can get there however you want. Um, so I'm sort of like thinking of the, the cat being like, this is where you go, but like there's many ways to get there. So um, I don't know, it just made me think about that, that there's not only one path to get to the, the end goal. And in fact, um I'm trying to make that slide go, but of course it won't go. There we go. Um, and in fact, right, that's the, that is the next point that I wanted to make. Um, that the work that we do and the path that we take, having said what you just said, but the work that we do and the path that we take are dictated by um, whatever the parameters of our goals are. So it is true that there is no um, there is no one best way, right? And the the reason, particular reason that I like this graphic, is because you can fly or you can drive, right? So you have some options. Um, and the truth is, you have a million options. You can you know driving from LA to um, to San Francisco or San Francisco to LA. I'm, I I don't remember where I lived when I did this. Um, you can take the five. You can take the 101. Is is anybody on the West Coast? We don't have a lot of West Coasters. Hmm, that's too bad. Um, you can take the five, you can take the 101, you can stop in San Luis Obispo, you can stop in Monterey, right? You can stop in Santa Barbara, you can um, spend three days. If you have parameters, it starts to limit what you can do, right? You want to get there in six hours, you want to get there in 10 hours, you don't want to stop for the night, you don't want to spend so much money. Um, and so your goals start to dictate the path that you're going to take. Um, your goals might be, you know, I want to spend as little as possible. I want to get there as quickly as possible. Um, uh, I love Susan's example, though, for the opposite reason. Um, I actually think that in the, um, not just in the Hillel world, and maybe even less so in the Hillel world, let me take the youth group world as an example. On the one hand, in the youth group world, um, it looks like, I'm going to say kids, kids are just planning programs left and right, like throwing them at the wall. Um, and it, there's not a lot helping them to stick together, right? There's not sort of a sense of rhyme or reason. On the other hand, when we take a step all the way back, what we realize in the youth group world is that um, the whole point, the whole the, the set of goals for youth groups are that, stu that teenagers get to exercise their autonomy and their independence. They're learning leadership. They're learning um, ownership. 
by their um, creating all of these programs, right? So on the on the zero foot level, it looks like um, they're just kind of driving, right? They're just they're doing what the Cheshire, Cheshire Cat said. They're just kind of meandering through the world of Jewishness and just like again throwing stuff at the wall and like seeing what sticks and having a good time. And it's only when we take a step back that we realize that the goal framework that there is an educational framework there, and the goal framework is that they become that they're in a state of becoming within the context of a Jewish environment. Um, a long time ago, I don't even remember what the year was, right? But around the transition from sort of, um, I, I may be about to step into a political mess, and I'm so sorry. Around the transition in Hillel from sort of the Richard Joel era to the CEI SJE era, um, I would say that Hillel was in the same place, and that there were a lot of students who were planning stuff. Um, it didn't necessarily have an educational framework. It didn't necessarily have a goal framework or an impact framework or a numbers framework, right? It was just stuff. And the intent was, well, you know, they're exercising their leadership skills by throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks and like planning, you know, what moves them. Um, and what I love about what your, what your supervisor said to you, Susan, is that they said to you, here's a specific, you know, impact related, numbers related, whatever kind of framework it was, goal framework. There is no one best way. And this is where you're going, right? So figure out the best way to get there um, using your resources, but keep your eye on the prize. Questions, comments, thoughts, reactions? Okay, so the rest of this webinar is basically exercising what I just said. It's very fancy. Um, do people still do Shabbat 100, Shabbat 500, Shabbat 1800? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so I've, what we're going to do in the, West, in the rest of the conversation is spend some time on numbers and spend some time on, um, on impact, right? And I would say that those two things are very complementary. I, I talk a lot about how depth is really important. Breath is also really important. If we're changing a life, that's incredible, um, but it's a lot more incredible if we're changing 100 lives and 500 lives and, you know, and 5,000 lives. So, um, so let's, let's put into, into practice this idea that we can get anywhere if we, um, you know, if we wander long enough, but if we want to get somewhere specific, we have to be very targeted and focused. Um, any, just before I ask any more questions, any thoughts off the bat about how to, um, what Shabbat 100, 500, 1,000? Great. Um, somebody want to explain? Um, I'll explain. Can you hear me? Yeah. It, it remind uh, us of who you are first, especially because we don't have all the pictures up. Rabbi Esther Reed, Rutgers University, Hillel, located Thanks, in New Esther. Jersey. We're the State University of New Jersey. Um, we actually don't do this, but the idea is if you, you know, think of a big number, how many Jewish students are on your campus, and you're not going to reach all of those students, but would be a, a large percentage of them. So on some campuses, that's Shabbat for 100, and for some campuses, that's Shabbat for 1,000, and you advertise we're going to have Shabbat for a thousand and really make a serious push for everybody to bring a friend and figure out unique advertising techniques and way to make it a really huge Shabbat experience. Perfect. Um, questions. Uh, Michelle says it's when you try to get a targeted large number of people to a Shabbat experience. Awesome. Okay, great. Okay. So this is the, this is the numbers framework we're going to work in for a minute or two. Um, that, so let's that, mention about a hundred eight. Jump in. That, yeah. Okay, I think that the critical thing is that it's often done in coalition and partnership. And that's why Interesting. it's Interesting. All right, so you're already planning. So no, 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 you're already no, planning. No, 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 Great. no. In other words, that's what it means. When, when you hear the word Shabbat 100 or Shabbat 500, it's usually or most often done between Hillel's and Chabad. It's not an independent oh, Hillel program. I mean, it could be, but that's not what the shorthand means. I mean... For this exercise, do what you want, but that's that's maybe why campuses do it or don't do it. Well, so okay, so great. So, is someone else jumping in? Yeah, what I was yeah, going to yeah, say yeah. is, oh, wow, that's loud. What I was going to say is that on our campus, the reason why it's so um, popular is because Hillel and Chabad partner together, and then we go to other organizations to have large student. Jewish student populations like Greek life and get them to like host tables and stuff because obviously like if there's just four Hillel professionals we can't reach 250 or a thousand people alone we need help and you kind of like mobilize the troops 
Great. So I would say it's not just that you can't do it alone. It's the, the flip side is also true. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of reasons why you would want to do a Shabbat 500 or a Shabbat 1800 or whatever it is. Um, maybe you want to create a, a mega event, right? Maybe you want to create a, a tremendous and significant moment of Jewish community and Jewish life on campus to say, like, we are all greater than ourselves. We are a force on this campus. Um, we're important, you know, to the larger university and we're important just because we're important, like, you know, to Jews on campus. There's a bunch of reasons why you might do it. Um, I want to put those aside for a second and focus on the numbers. So I would say it's not just that you can't do it yourselves. It's that the strategic way to do this is to piece it out, right? So again, going back, if I can get my slides to do this, um, going back to... Uh, 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 I can't get the slides to go back. Going going back to um to the Cheshire Cat, everything comes back to the Cheshire Cat. Um you 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 could meander through the numbers, right? You could recruit here, you could recruit there, maybe you'd get to 75, maybe you would get to 450, right? Maybe you'd get to a huge number. Um but if you want to be really concrete and strategic and focused, you're not saying, you know, hey, come with me, hey, come with me. Instead, you're saying we want to get to a thousand. We're going to go to student government and we're going to go to these student government people and we're going to ask them to, you know, buy a table. They're not really buying a table, but you know what I mean. They're, they're going to create a table, right? Um, we're going to go to this fraternity and this sorority. We're going to go to this club. We're going to go to this class. We're going to go to this professor, right? You're, you're sitting down with a strategy on the front end and you're breaking down the student, uh, the university community to get to that 1800. You know where you want to go and you're starting with the end in mind and you're going to be very focused along the way on what your resources are and how you can organize them to come together to get to your numeric end. Again, questions, comments, thoughts, reactions. Okay, well, let's keep going. Again, slides, come on, be with me, be with me. There we go, okay. Oh, I have to make this text go away. Um, so, Julie, do you know how I make the text go away? I have to go to annotate eraser. Brilliant. Okay. So um, I'm assuming that this framework looks looks familiar to everybody, although it might I recognize that it might not, right? Although um, for me to like share it with you is is I mean this isn't my framework and I learned it from you. Um, I, I think it's pretty smart. Uh, I think it's pretty rare in the Jewish world, actually. Although um, BBYO at this point also has these kinds of targets that build up. Um, these numbers, I can't remember if I made up or I took them from, you know, like a made up pillow. Um, but these are the numbers, obviously, that break down the 2200, 1000, 350, 350, right? That break down um, the funnel of engagement that every organization should have, not just the Hillel, but, you know, we talk about it at federations, about Jewish community in general. Um, every, every, organization that is engaging people in some kind of cause or social change has what's called a ladder of engagement um, and and which really is a funnel and it goes from like the widest point um, where you're involving as many people as possible to the narrowest point which is really about you know the people who are um, completely internalizing your vision of what the world can be so um, okay so I just want to like pause here. We're looking at these numbers. We're looking at these definitions, right? And now I want to ask a question, which is how do you get to 2200 and how do you get to 1000 and how do you get to, you know, to 350 students having six or more high impact experiences, six or more um, touches, not high impact experiences. Um, anybody want to share? What's your magic? Okay, so here's where I want to take a case. Actually, we won't take a case yet. Um, so this is funny because I feel like Susanna, a little bit I learned this from you. Um, but I would do the same thing that you just did with Shabbat 1800, right? You sit down, and, and this is particularly true if you're starting from scratch. Um, or, or let me say that differently. In this case, I'm going to pretend that I'm starting from scratch. None of you is starting from scratch, right? All of you are starting from some place where you already have students that you're in contact with. You already have students that um, have had one or more experiences, right? You already have students that have had six or more experiences. More importantly, you already have students who've had two or three or four experiences that you can push to get to six, right? 
Um, so, so that's really the question. The question is, even when you start from scratch, you sit down and say, just like you did for Shabbat, 1,000 or 1,800 or whatever, you sit down and say, well, what do we have? What do I know? Um, what am I working with? And what are the small goals that I'm going to set within each one of these columns? So um, if I want to have contact, if I want to be in contact with 2,200 students, um, I'm already, and I know that I'm already in contact with 1,500 students, what I'm going to do is I'm then going to say to myself, I need 700 more. Where am I going to get 700? What are all of my, the possibilities that I have to be in contact with new students? How many do I think I'm realistically going to get from each of these chances? How many new contacts do I think I'm realistically going to get from tabling at the Student Activities Day, you know, in September? How many contacts do I realistically think I'm going to get from students walking into the building during the year? Um, and then how many, like, uh, I don't know what you would call this, not this, new student events do I need to do in order to raise my contact numbers? Um, so what I want to actually ask us to do is do a little bit of independent written work and, um, and ask some people to work on contact and on Brett and on um, six plus. So either do it from scratch or probably do it in your own, um, in your own campus. Say to yourself, okay, and if you, if you want to use the 2200 goal, that's fine. If you want to use your own goals, that's obviously better. Um, say to yourself, okay, where do I want to be and where am I now? What are my chances for, um, what are my existing opportunities for getting to where I want to be? And what opportunities do I need to create because I don't have enough opportunities as it is? Does that make, does that work make sense? Okay, some, some nods, some blinks. So, um, so I'm going to assume it makes sense. Ask questions if you've got them. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, um, somebody jumping in. Yeah, it's Susanna. Um, I just, I don't, I know a lot of people on the call. I don't know everybody. Um, I'm wondering about people who think they don't have a starting point. If there is, is there any, if there is anybody on that, there's somebody who doesn't even know where they are, text, you know, chat me privately and I'll walk you through it. But my sense is everybody does have a starting point. Yes. Okay. Um, and we're only going to do this for the individual work for like three minutes and then we're going to come back together and try to workshop it together. So, um, so don't, you know, the, the whole point is to, um, and this is how you grow, right? The whole point um, is to experiment with something in a safe place that um, you don't maybe get to experiment with in your day-to-day -day work because you're running, running, running and to prepare you for the summer when hopefully you're going to do more of this with your team. So, um, you know, don't feel like you're falling in the deep end. Um, or if you do feel like you're falling in the deep end, it's not you, it's the work, but we're going to get you out of it pretty soon. Okay, so I'm going to um, assign a different group of people. You're going to work individually, but I'm going to assign a different group of people to work on each piece, and I'm doing this randomly. So Meg, Susan, Susanna, and Alyssa, um, you guys work on contact. So your question is, um, what, what, use 2200 or whatever your goal is. How do, what existing opportunities do I have? What opportunities, what do I think I'm going to get out of those? What opportunities do I need to create in order to get to my goal? Uh, Mar Mara or Mara, Mara, um, Marley, Maggie, and Kayla, you guys are going to work on Brett. Um, uh, Becca, Esther, Alex, and Anna, you guys are going to work on six plus. How do you get to, um, you know, how do you get students to, to six or more um, touches? And then Michal, uh, Leah, I think, and Michelle, um, you guys are going to work on high impact. And we're going to do this for like three minutes, not long at all. Ready to go. Are you going to break us off into uh, chat groups or something? No, no, no. Do it. Do, do the work individually for this one, and then we'll come back together. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was confusing.
Okay, let's take one more minute. Okay, thoughts about um, contact-related goals. We could probably do thoughts about any of it, but let's focus on contact because it'll be different kinds of programming that we'll be doing for each. Um, thoughts about contact-related goals. What did you guys think about, about this one? How did you approach it? How did you think about it? What did you realize you needed to do? Um, I can jump in and start. Um, so one of the things based off what some people said earlier is to look at groups that you could get meet with. Um, for example, something like the vegetarian club, there could be Jews in that mm -hmm. club that you've never met before. Um, so sort of branching out and reaching into other groups that are based on interests that you may find new Jews that you've never met. Um, mm -hmm. That was one idea that I had. Another idea um, was to also use our current networks to reach out to other networks. So getting our most involved students to, again, bring a friend to a Shabbat or bring a friend to something, to a welcome back event. Because um, oftentimes the students know each other, they just don't necessarily come to things. So that's another good way to reach out to more and more people. Good, 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 good. What else? I was thinking about like a lot of um, the stuff that like we do at the beginning of the year, which is like tabling at the big, um, thing where like all the organizations have tables, um, that kind of a thing. And people kind of like always just walk over to the table with their friends and, you know, fill out a form, write their name and email. That is like right there getting you tons of contacts. Um, and different things like that on campus, whether it be like tabling or we um, did something this year with like, like giveaways. A lot of people were coming up to the table and we did make them give up, you know, us their email, name and email and everything. Um, so just, I think things that are going to like really attract the masses to like yep. give you their, their info. Yep. 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 Um, and I, I want to point out probably if I were a better teacher, I could, I could, I could help you guys articulate this, but I'm not. So I just want to point this out. Um, in the ideal, what happens is you, you only have so much time, right? And so one of the questions is, how are you allocating time? Um, I mean, that's, that's part of why you're doing this, because um, you need to achieve your goals within the resources that you have. So what I'm trying to say is, um, you sit down and you work on contact-related stuff until you think you're going to get to your goal, right? So the question is, well, how many names do I think I'm, to be completely cross, how many names of human beings do I think I'm going to get from going to the vegetarian club and the, you know, rugby club and so on and so forth, right? I'm going to get 20? Great. Um, I need 100. So there's 20. Now I'm going to think about student activities day. I'm going to get 30? Great. There's 30. I need 50 more, right? And then as soon as you get to 100, you stop. And, but also, um, check in with yourself at different points in the year, right? Because that's, you might need to make a course correction. Um, if you, um, if you needed 100 new names, um, and you thought you were going to get 30 from Student Activities Day, and you only got 20, that means you need to get 10 from elsewhere, right? So where during the year are you going to get 10? And that's how you shift your programming. So it, it obviously doesn't work this way in real life, because um, we're not always autonomous who are like, you know, completely focused on goals, and our meetings are not that organized. Um, but I, I think it's helpful to remember that you have, we all have opportunities to, to um, you know, to, to like be jargony for a second, make course corrections, um, be really oriented around numbers. Um, and, um, and change our, you know, make a course correction, change our strategy, um, even in the middle, if we need to, because we need to be focusing more on, you know, increasing our breadth rather than increasing our depth or vice versa. Okay, having said that, now let's go to depth. Um, one plus, one, 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 at least one touch. Who worked on that? I did. Marley. Do you want to go? I would like to go. Um, so I, um, my whole thing was accessibility for that. And so having um, events and programs where students are in the dorms and fraternity sorority houses on campus, um, utilizing the engagement interns 
Um, a lot of times people won't come to something if they don't know somebody. So having, I guess the same kind of thing with contact, having people bring a friend to an event, um, also offering rides to Hillel events um, if we can, and maybe having students help give those rides. Um, so student contact as well. And we have made a lot of um, contacts with OnePlus for our soup deliveries. So when people are sick, we get parents calling us and they're like, is this really a thing? I'm like, yes, I will bring you matzo ball soup. It's real. So, yes. That's great. Good, good, good. Uh, what's next? Six plus, right? Six plus is next. I have to go back to my slides. Six plus. I can go. Great. Um, okay, so right now we are about 19% of what we want in terms of six plus, um, but we're hoping obviously for, for 30%. So right now we have 195, um, and our goal number is 328. Some things that we already do that work really well for that is our AB trips. Um, we have tons of seminars that go on that are run by like myself, our rabbi, our engagement associate and director. Um, and because those meet regularly, those automatically get anyone who's involved to a six plus. Um, also just something we've started like specifically reaching out to students who we feel like we could kind of bump that up to um, specifically just like also to see if there's anything that they want to get involved in long term. Um, and some things we haven't already done that we're looking to, I mean, just like ideas, but um, having incentives for going to all of some things. So like, for instance, having a series of, we do something called Nosh Nights with our like two engagement vice presidents, our student vice presidents. And, um, you know, perhaps if there was something where, oh, if you go to all of them in a quarter, this happens, or, you know, you fill all the stamps, something like that. So maybe incentives for going to something we already have often, uh, but you get people kind of coming back and, you know, because the, if they are all different, if it's not just the same thing over and over again. So Becca, you said so many important things. So the first thing I want to highlight is, um, or so many helpful things, also important, but um, the first thing I want to highlight is just that you knew your numbers, right? So if I were in charge of the world, um, I, I would make sure that all of us knew our numbers. Because otherwise, we're, we're working, we're like, you know, we're, we're not working on the, the route from LA to San Francisco. We're like over here in Kansas. There's nothing wrong with Kansas, but if we don't want to be in Kansas, we shouldn't be there, right? Um, so it, I don't remember the, the first number where you are. You're at like 195 and you need to be at 328. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so my guess is um, some team of people at Northwestern Hill are having a, a conversation every day, every week about, uh, you know, about that difference, right? About that 130-ish difference. Um, yeah, 130-ish difference and how you're going to get there. Um, so that's point one. Point two is um, related to that, the reason to have that conversation is because then your programming team gets to have the internal and external conversations of, well, what do we do differently, right? What do we push? What are we pushing on? You can go through lists. Again, I don't mean to be crass. You can go through lists of who's at four and say, how can we engage people who, who are only at three or only at four and help them get to five and six before the end of the year? all for the sake of heaven, all for the sake of building Jewish community and Jewish life and, you know, Jewish humans. Um, you can add new programs, right? So um, what I also love about what you said is it sounds like you also said at some point, what opportunities is our Hillel going to offer that gets people to six, right? So seminars are a great way because six is already built in. Um, if you only have opportunities as a Hillel for people to engage once or twice, there's no, um, it's that much harder for you to get them to six touches, right? Or to a high impact experience. Um, and then you also said to yourself, well, how do we get people really to get their six out of that seminar? We offer an incentive. And then you'll say, okay, the incentive is working for 10 people. We need it to work for 10 more. What else we can do, right? Can we do, right? So it's constantly looking at the data and saying to yourself, um, what data do we have? Is it, you know, to what extent is it indicating that we're getting to our goals? What program resources do we have? And how do we, how do we use our program resources to get to our goals? Again, questions, comments, thoughts, reactions. Well, this is my question. I've been um, thinking this whole time while you've been talking about this, and I ran all our numbers. Um, you know, we are doing a really good job with tracking because we've started using Swipe. And if you don't know what that is, there's going to be another Hill U webinar later this week about that. Um, and based on those numbers, we're nowhere near 70%. We're nowhere near 
with 6,000 Jewish students on our campus, we just don't have the capacity to reach the number of students. So how do I determine what my goal is? Am I only trying to do breadth? Am I only trying to do high impact? Am I only trying to get six plus? Like, I don't even know where to go. I feel like everyone's doing really good work, but with six people on our programming staff, you can't have each of us reach a thousand students. It's just not physically possible. So um, I, I would honestly, and this is a big thing to say without talking more. I mean, you only talked for about 45 seconds and I'm about to say a big thing. I would, I would, I would think about changing everything you're doing. Um, so I would, I would pro and this is, I mean, again, like, I don't know if I'm stepping into a political disaster, but this is what Richard Joel did when he came into Hillel, right? When he came into Hillel, none of you remember this. This is before most of you were born. Um, when he came into Hillel in 1987, I think, right? Um, he said, we've been doing a great job with depth. We've been doing a terrible job with breath. We're going to stop doing depth, basically, and we're going to focus entirely on breath. I'm exaggerating dramatically, um, but but that is basically what happened. And and Hillel became something that was owned by many more people. It was much more superficial, right? Um, and so maybe that was too much toward that toward breath. But um, but it's that kind of dramatic change that I would think about. I would I would go on like a two day retreat. I mean, again, you spoke for 45 seconds, right? And I am happy to have this conversation offline because I do I do love it, and it's not an easy thing. Um, I would I would go on like a two day retreat, and I would say like you know, what are we really doing, right? Like, and what's getting us there and how does our staff use our use their time? Um, and and given, you know, the reality of our Hillel and the reality of our, of our campus and the reality of our resources and all that kind of stuff, um, what do we think we need to do? And like, what would we need to look like in order to get to 70, 70 percent? Um, what would, and then what would we keep? What would we need to build new? And then what's realistic to raise money for in the first year, in the second year, in the third year, in the fifth year, right? You're not going to, you're not going to get to 70% in one year. Um, but I think you can start the growth plan that can get you there. Um, I just also okay. want to say that as somebody who's worked a long time with these numbers, 70 and 30 are supposed to be aspirational. So, so if you are making 70 and 30, probably your starting number is wrong, but that's a different question. So I think that it's important, though, to know that it's aspirational. And part of what it is is if you're tracking multiple years, you can start to see where your growth is, right? And then you can use what Beth just said in a more targeted way of thinking. But, but, to, but to go from a low number to try to say, I'm going to hit 70, not with the resources, that are out there staff wise or money wise. So I think it's important to to have um, a sense that it's it's what we're hoping for. And each year you're looking for growth. I'm gonna also the other add, thing, I, jump in. I was gonna add also um because I was also a six plus assigned you know thing. Um, I also actually achieved, we exceeded our six plus our goal, a 30% goal at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and it's very different because we, have to, we do have a rather small, relatively small uh, campus. So um, uh, achieving, achieving that, the, the, the depth rather than the breadth was probably as difficult as having to be depth with you know, 6,000 people, um, Jewish, Jewish students. But I know that I was going to add um, what we do is, is ensure that we are inspiring and empowering students to be engaged with themselves. Um, I, I don't pay any CEA. I don't have CEAs. I don't have, because the campus is actually that small. We don't really have that resource or, or that interest from student interest from students to be paid networkers, but engagers. We call them and so networkers. So we now have networkers who, um, and we call them networkers. We, we train with social interactions and those that we frame it differently. And um, that's helping us reach the, the, the breath and then we use that to, to engage each other in more conversations and pass you know I meet someone and I make sure that I pass them to a student and then all of a sudden they have all these interactions one-on-ones find some meaningful and then they go on both right or they come to a Shabbat or, or they find a reason to be a member of the community and that that goes down in depth. Um, well and this is the this right so this is exactly the conversation Esther that I would have. CEI is a force um, it, you know and student engagers in general are a force multiplier um, uh, initiative, right? The the whole I and the whole question that was asked 15 years ago or whatever was, given the resources that a Hillel is ever going to have professionally, um, how do we use the resources that we have to reach 70% or some 
significant number of students on campus because we're never going to have 20 professionals, you know, working working in the, from the building, right? Um, and so the question for Rutgers and the question for Washington and Lee and the question for Binghamton is, um, what is the um, the apparatus? And I don't only mean or the infrastructure, and I don't only mean the professional infrastructure. Um, what's the professional and student infrastructure that we need in order to get to 70 percent? Um, and you do it the same way you do Shabbat 1800 or the same way you do, you know, the, a programming goal. You say like, okay, we're going to have an Israel fellow and she's going to reach, you know, she's going to be able to realistically reach um, 80 students, be in contact with 80 students during the year or 200 students during the year. I don't actually even know what it is. Um, uh, so that's 200, right? You know, what's the, uh, what's another professional going to do? If we add another professional, what are they going to do? Um, if we now, um, again, I don't mean to be cross. If we add a professional for $60,000, what are they going to do versus a professional for $120,000? We can get two for 60, right? And so on and so forth. So, um, that's the, um, you know, that's the, um, that's the starting conversation. And, and, and of course, it does need to be driven by, um, by goals because then we can actually, um, we can actually achieve what we're trying to achieve. So I want to, I want to push us on, um, because our work isn't only, oh, it's earlier than, I, no, 10.53, that's what I thought. Um, our work isn't only about breadth, um, and I, um, I'm a little bit sorry that, um, that we spent so much time there because it's just it's antithetical to actually to who I am. Um, skipping over this very quickly, I did want to um, point out the following. I'm just going to talk in like a really boring way. So um, uh, there are systems, again, you may not need, need me to tell you this, but I do want to point it out. There are systems built into your work that are constantly pushing you um, towards starting with the end in mind. I love that the goal setting sheet, the personal goal setting sheet um, for Hillel starts with your local Hillel mission and vision. If we had more time, I would ask you what you thought about this. Um, my own thought about it is that it's because everything builds up, right? All of the work of every person in the Hillel, everybody who's working on behalf of the Hillel builds up to achieve a certain thing. Um, and we figured out a long time ago that even though Hillel International has a mission and a vision, each local Hillel needs to be able to articulate its own mission and vision, um, its own articulation of, of our purpose in this work um, that's right for your own campus and your own town and your own students and your own university. Um, and, and again, everything contributes to that. So it starts with that. And then the next question is, how are your individual work goals going to advance that, right? Um, side note, it's also interesting that your, um, and, and it makes total sense, that your personal goals worksheets for the year have all these different kinds of goals, right? So there's work-related goals, there's learning goals, there's behavioral goals, there's growth goals, all of this kind of stuff sort of fits together to help you be a productive, um, you know, generative member of the team achieving your own vision and mission. Um, okay, so having said that you have your own local, you know, your own unique vision and mission um, for your own local Hillel, there is the stuff that we're working with in Hillel Big Adol and Hillel generally. Um, and the stuff is, um, you know, related to, to the depth, to the impact that we want to have. I, I still don't totally understand, so you'll forgive me, how active any of this language is anymore. Um, but my hope is, I guess, I guess if you're an Ezra Fellow, it's very active. Um, my hope is that it's incredibly active for all of you. Um, because, and again, I, Susanna, I feel like this comes out of a conversation you and I had like 10 years ago. Um, because if we want people to develop positive Jewish memories and learn stuff and know stuff and know who they are Jewishly and have self-confidence and have a Jewish community and be with Jewish people and have Jewish friends, we need to integrate all of that stuff into as much of what we do as possible. Um, so the example, pretend there's not five minutes left and really focus on what I'm saying. Um, the, you know, I, I hope you're not all like getting ready for your next meeting. Um, I will end on time. Um, the example that I've been using lately is such a powerful one for me. Um, I take my daughter to swimming at the JCC every weekend and she's learning to swim. If the JCC were also building community in the class, we would, of, of course, I didn't say that my daughter's 15 months old, right? So she's not getting to know the other students in the class, although she is sort of, and she like kisses them when she, you know, gets into the pool. Um, what's actually happening is the parents talk. I don't know any of the parents' names unless we introduce ourselves. I don't know anything about them, right? There's no community building that the JCC has built in. I am not getting a Jewish community um, or even necessarily Jewish memories 
out of this experience. The JCC could do it totally differently. They could actually have the parents introduce themselves even when we're in the pool. We could have a parent play date, right, outside of the pool and so on and so forth. They could do a ton of stuff if they wanted us to be building a Jewish community. Same thing for Hillel. Um, if you guys want to help the students see Judaism as an integral part of their adult lives, knowingly use Jewish values to make life decisions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of this stuff needs to be integrated into the work that you're doing. Um, and um, this makes it even more concrete, right? So this probably looks a little bit more familiar to you. Um, and I would sit down in the same way that you do with the numbers, sit down and we say, and look at all of your programs and say, where can I integrate opportunities to build community into these programs? Where can I integrate opportunities for students to be reflective into these programs? Where can I integrate opportunities for students to be producers, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, sometimes it's going to be obvious, right? You're going to do names and some kind of connection question um, at, the, at the beginning of a program. You're going to make sure people don't leave feeling anonymous. You're going to teach all of your student leaders and your student engagers to do the same thing so that if they're making chala, the students are also friendly and introducing themselves and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes it might be that you need to introduce new program. So, you know, you might be like creating a fellowship around um, student ownership, right? You might be going back to the other one, um, see Judaism as an integral part of their adult lives. You might run a fellowship for seniors about what it means to be a Jewish adult. You might add whole new opportunities into your calendar because these are specifically the depth goals that you want to create. You know where you want to go. You need to be able to look at your programming calendar or your infrastructure and say these are the opportunities that um, literally concretely, these are the opportunities that feed into each one of these goals. And I know that I'm covering maybe not all, but a bunch of these goals with the work that we're doing in the next year. Okay, I'm going to stop the share um, so that we can see our, each other's faces. Um, but all these resources are available to you, you know, throughout Hillel. Um, again, questions, comments, thoughts, reactions, and now we really are in the last minute. Where do you go from here? Hi, Michael Simon. <laughs> so I'm actually thinking about kind of the, the idea of starting with the end. And I think what you were just talking about with like the local hill out. So we have a mission and vision. We have sort of like goals that we've set out, but not in that formal of a way. And I think it's really, it's something I've been thinking about a lot as we're onboarding new staff. It's really interesting to think about how do all of our goals align with each other? How does my staff's goals align with my goals, align with our Hillel's goals? And thinking about it, you know, before new people come in, in a very structured way, how are we actually doing all of these things in ways that help us achieve those goals? So it's funny that Michael Simon just poked his head in because he used to work for somebody named Bernie Steinberg at Harvard Hillel, and I learned this from Bernie Steinberg. Um, Bernie, I know we're on the hour. Bernie had a mantra, has a mantra, which is that um, that as an educator, he's trying to help people be human Jewishly. He had, um, he used to study um, a whole, is Michael from the room? He used to study um, pieces of text with his staff where he would inculcate everybody into his understanding of Jewish education and Jewish leadership. And they would then carry that to their staff and students. And it was, the reason I'm saying it is because it was, it wasn't just, Michelle, that all the goals flowed together, although that's obviously clutch. It was also that the goals were present in this language that they used every day. The, the, the best case scenario of this is that each of us understands why Judaism is important to us, what it means to be a Jewish educator, what it means to be a Jewish leader, and we're expressing that every day in our work, and it's trickling down into every opportunity that our students have to interact with our Hillel and our people, right, our students and our staff. Um, and that's hard, right? I'm sure Bernie didn't wake up one day and, and go, I think that my mantra is be human Jewishly. Um, but like, but that's, you know, that's the, the, the place that all of us, I hope, can, can get into in our work as Jewish leaders is that we can embody our sense of purpose and carry that with us um, and talk about it on a regular basis because that's how we make sure that it's, it's you know, trickling into everything we do. Questions, comments, thoughts, reactions? I'm available. Go team. Have great summers where you, you know, look at a big piece of white paper and you make all of us connect together. Please take a brief evaluation on the session. Julie includes the link. 
in the chat box. Um, go team. Enjoy Thank this you. graduation season. Thank you, Beth. And our next session is next week with Mark Oppenheimer on when innovation goes wrong. Oh, good. Yeah. Good session. Yay. Thank you.